As we look at 1 Peter chapter 5, we see where Peter is closing up this letter written to people in Asia Minor, and he knows that there's just a small matter of time until church persecution comes. A lot of the people who are going to be reading this letter, some of them would be dead in a few years. Some of them would be in prison in a few years. Some of them would be scattered to different parts of the empire because of the persecution which was about to happen. Peter recognized also the false teaching which was coming into town and was beginning a little bit and a little bit and a little bit more. And he realized the time was not long until the apostles were gone, until it would just be a few church leaders, until it would just be the scriptures that would lead folks. And so as he closes his book, he says, here are five things that we need to get in our congregation to be sure that we're rock solid. That to be sure that we are what God wants us to be. And you know, if you've listened to very many of my sermons, I love this congregation. And I love every aspect of this congregation. And I think many of these things, which we're going to talk about today, are really things that we already have going on in this church. But all five of them are things that we can improve. All five of them are things that we need to guard. All five of them are things which we can always focus on to see if we can be what God wants us to be. And so what is it that God wants of every congregation to be a rock-solid church? If you're there in chapter 5, let's read verses 1 through 4. And as we read verses 1 through 4, we're going to read about good leadership. Peter here writes, and here in verse 1, this is New King James I'm reading from, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but rather being examples to the flock. And when that chief shepherd, that's Jesus, appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will not fade away. Peter here is telling us two different things about elders and leaders in the church. First of all, he's describing who they are. You've got to have the right character of a man in order to be a good elder. And each elder should have this character before they become an elder, but they should always work on fulfilling these three roles. You can't have some elders who fill one role and some elders who fill the other. They have to fill all three of these roles that are here. And then the second thing, not just talking about character, he wants to talk about motivation. And we'll talk about that motivation here in just a little bit. But what's he telling us when you look here at character? 1 Peter 5 works as a parallel passage to Acts 28. And it's in Acts 28 and also 1 Peter 5 that you see the three titles, or I like to say the three roles, of an elder. R-O-L-E-S. What an elder is. First and foremost, that word elder there. What's that mean? Somebody might say old. Well, not really old. It's mature. Someone who is, according to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, not a novice in the faith. It needs to be somebody who knows that congregation well. Someone who is experienced in living life. Someone who understands not only in what they've lived, but they can help other people to, as they endure different problems that are universal to folks. Back in the Old Testament times, we see in Psalm chapter 1, and we see in other passages in Proverbs, and we even see in the book of Job, many times the older men would meet together during the day. Now, I've noticed here in Marshall County, men oftentimes will meet together for breakfast. And you've got your different crews who go in different places. You've got some guys at Four Pigs, some guys at Dairy Queen, some guys at um, uh, JoJo's. And they get together and they talk. Well, in the first century, oftentimes they would meet at the gate. And if you had a problem in life and you needed to know, uh, what should I do in this situation? You would go to the gate of the city where those mature people were, those people who had seen life, and they could help you through that situation. And so when we're thinking about an eldership, we need to have those kind of people, those kind of people you can approach who have lived life and kind of have some of the answers of life. The second word used as you look through here is the word oftentimes translated pastor, better translated to be a shepherd. 
A shepherd is different than other kind of people who keep animals. Cattle act a certain way. Goats are just evil. Chickens are almost as evil. But sheep need somebody to guide them. They need to be shown where to eat. They need to be shown where to drink. They need to be guided to a good place that's easy to eat. It's hard for them to see enemies. It's hard for them to notice predators. And so sheep need somebody that they can trust who will provide for their needs. And so when Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is writing this passage here in 1 Peter chapter 5, he's saying, look for men who have a character of loving and caring about other folks. Being an elder is more than building programs. It's more than budget. It's more than staffing issues or whatever else it may be. It's caring for the souls of the church. It's caring for the flock of God. A book was written many decades ago called They, De they uh, Smell Like Sheep. And the purpose of that book, as you go through it, is talking about how an eldership needs to be among the people enough to where they kind of, they resemble the people in which they're leading. Now the third title, which we see here, is called an overseer, or it's called a bishop, or we would call it today a manager. Uh, perhaps you went to a restaurant today, perhaps you went to a supermarket today. As you go into that restaurant or supermarket, many times those restaurants or supermarkets will have a manager. And the pur purpose of that person is she needs to make sure it's staffed. She needs to make sure there's proper groceries or proper food that's being done. She needs to be sure that the people in that restaurant or in that grocery store are working or acting in a way in which they need, which will help that place stay in business. Now, in the first century, this word manager was a little bit different. The vast majority of Jewish people now lived outside of Palestine. And so because they lived outside of Palestine, they still inherited certain areas. And so what they would do is they'd hire a manager to run that olive press or to run that farm field or whatever else it would be. And that person would make sure that it was taken care of and that it would return a profit. And so that's the aspect, that's the character that God is telling us that he wants to see in the leadership of the church. He wants people who are mature, who understand about people and about life. They've lived life, their husbands and one wife, they've raised faithful children. He wants people who love folks, who actually care for the souls of the church. And he wants people who recognize that you need to manage, that you are in the people business and trying to help people to grow, trying to help people find a place to serve, trying to help people as they go through the issues of life. And so that's the reason why these three titles are given in the Bible here in 1 Peter 5 and also in Acts chapter 20. But Peter keeps on here and he goes into the negative to describe the heart of these people. What should make you to be or want to be an elder? Look there in verse 2. He says, when they become shepherds, when they become managers, when they become elders, they need to do it not by compulsion, but willingly. It needs to be a job that they would like to have, something that excites them, something that motivates them to help the church. It's not something that they have to do, because you know how it is when you have to do a job. It should be people who are motivated, who love people, and who love that work. Number two, not for dishonest gain, but rather they should do it eagerly. Of course, in the first century, many times elders were paid. And many times people would fill the role of an elder and a preacher. And sometimes when money is involved, people will become dishonest. And they will look to take advantage of others. Now, in our modern context, in Western civilization here, we usually don't pay elders. But there are sometimes people who will want to be an elder, not necessarily because of money, but because of power or because of the opportunity to do things the way that they want, or because they want to rule over the church. And Peter is saying, be very careful that you don't find people who have this motivation of power, this motivation of being in charge, this motivation of being in control, but you have people who are there truly because they love the church and love the people 
of the church. And that brings us to verse 3. Not being in charge, not being lords, but rather being examples. Knowing how to work with people. Knowing how to love people. Knowing how to show people the way. And so when Peter starts this passage, he says, first of all, if you want to have a rock-solid church, work on having those kind of men. Work on having those kind of men who love people, who want the church to grow, who have been through life and they've done well. And we've been blessed at our congregation because all of our elders are that way. They have those attitudes. They have that mindset. And that's one of the reasons why our congregation is doing so well. Now, secondly, going to verse 5 through 7, not only does a rock-solid church need to have good leadership, it needs to have a sense of humility. Read with me, if you will, 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's begin in verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit or humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. Submit. Oh, that's a word we don't like to hear very often. But we read in our Bibles that we are to submit to our government, Romans 13. We read in our Bibles that we are to submit one to another, Ephesians 5 and verse 21. We see that we are to submit in marriage. When you look at Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, husbands, the way that you help in your church, in your family, is that you lead with love, following the serving example of Jesus Christ. Ladies, the Bible says, submit to your husbands as Christ does to the church and support him and encourage him to be a godly person. We are told to submit to our elders in Hebrews chapter 13, looking at verse 7 and looking at verse 11 as well. So often, one of the issues that we have is it's hard for us to be humble. We look at the wonderful things that we've done. We look at our life story. We look at the knowledge we have. We look at our talent. And so often in the church, we have people who want to raise themselves up to maybe be a more prominent family, to maybe be a more talented person, to maybe be a person who matters a little bit more than everybody else. And maybe sometimes people compare themselves by the way in which they give or by the way in which they serve or by the way in which there's a talent or by the way in which they have a family history. And God says to us through the Bible, the way to have a good church is for every one of us to recognize the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We've got to treat one another as brethren. We've got to love one another and realize it's God who exalts us by his grace. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. It's God who exalts us and not ourselves. It is God who judges us and not ourselves. And it is God who is in charge. Now, closely related to this, and let me go off subject just real quick. I won't do it for long. So often, I think we run into what's called the Elijah syndrome. And what I mean by the Elijah syndrome is we're going back to 1 Kings 19. Uh, Elijah stands against the 400 prophets of Baal. And, of course, they act in the right way. You know, the, the prophets of Baal fail because their God's not real. Elijah's God is real. And so he's victorious and he kills all these false prophets. He thinks everybody's going to follow God now. He even leads the chariot of the king because he expects things to go well. Of course, Jezebel brings Ahab right back into idolatry, and Elijah just goes in the wilderness, and he's broken. When God comes to Elijah, Elijah over and over says, God, I'm alone. I'm the only one here who's trying. I'm the only one in the whole nation who is standing up. I'm the only one anywhere around who really cares about any of this. Of course, God feeds him. God helps him to rest. God shows him a king, God shows him a prophet, God shows him a brother. And God says, remember, Elijah, there are 3,000 people in this nation who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You are not alone. But sometimes, even in the modern church, we want to martyr ourselves. And we stand back and we say, you know, it feels like I'm the only one who's working here. And it feels like I'm the only one who's trying. 
And I'm the only one who's working. And when that attitude comes in, remember humility. Remember that it's God working through us. Remember we're all part of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're all part of the Christ working together, being what God wants us to be. Now let's look at verse 8 and 9. 8 and 9, resist the devil. Be sober. That means to be watchful, be vigilant. Because our adversary, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Stay steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are evident or present in the brotherhood, in the brotherhood throughout the entire world. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 tells us to wear the full armor of God because by so doing, you can resist the wiles of the devil. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the feet or the boots of peace, the, uh, the uh, belt of truth, the sword of the spirit. Put these things on. Realize there are people, especially Satan, who wants to bring you down. There are things in this world that are going to try to trip you up in your Christian walk. Now, we read in John 8 that the devil is the father of all liars. And we see that in Genesis 3. We see that in Matthew 4. And we see that in a lot of different passages. And let me tell you, Satan is lying to you tonight. The devil through this culture is trying to convince you of things that absolutely are not true and are not so. Let's run through just a few examples. God in the beginning made man male and female. He put Adam in the garden and created Eve. And his intention is for marriage. His intention is for faithfulness even to the point of death. His intention is that the two become one flesh. And that's just not talking about the sexual aspect. It's talking about every aspect of the family. God intended for mothers and for fathers to raise their children up and to nurture in the admonition of the Lord so they would not depart from God. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. But when you listen to the culture, the culture will tell you so many different variations of what I've said. And it sounds good. It sounds loving. It sounds like it's wiser than the old-fashioned stuff of the Bible. But all these things absolutely are not new. All these variations have existed almost since the beginning. And God's way works well every single time. Don't listen to the lies but rather trust God. Morality. Every person did what is right in their own eyes. And you have a lot of people who are breaking things down, deconstructing. You have a lot of people who they see what the Bible teaches, but they have a different, perhaps in their mind, a higher morality. They see things and they judge it by what this world sees and what this world thinks. And they live and they say, God wants me to be happy. I have these urges. I have these desires. And God must have made me this way. Otherwise, I wouldn't have this sort of thing. God wants me to fulfill whatever it is that I want to do. Satan's lying. Culture's lying. Trust God and God will see you through. There are people who look at the word of God. And they try to break down its authenticity. It's a book. It's 3,000 years old. Actually, that's an argument for the Bible. <laughs> they say, well, you know, uh, maybe I've had a college professor or somebody tell me that the Bible's not true. And yet we see Psalm 19.7, the word of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. It's the word of God that gives us the light to our path and shows us the way. Psalm 119, 105. It's God's word that helps us to be complete. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's living and powerful and is sharper to the point to where it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. But people oftentimes will listen to Satan 
And he'll say, well, the Bible says that, but my pastor says this. The Bible says that, but my parents live this way. The Bible says that, but that's not the popular opinion. That's not what everybody else thinks. Satan is the father of all lies. How is a person saved? Is he saved because he's good? Is he saved because he's sincere? Is he saved because he is religious? Is he saved just because everybody's going to be saved? The Bible teaches that we're saved through the blood of Christ. And it's only through Jesus that we find salvation. Where do you find Jesus? You find it, find him through the teachings of Scripture. And so it's only by understanding the word of God, it's only by growing in faith and repentance, it's only through baptism that you and I are translated into the Lord's church, not a denomination. There's not denominations in the Bible. There's not different sects in the Bible, S-E-C-T-E-S. There is one church, and the Lord adds you to that one church. How do you identify the church? It's a church that follows the Bible. Now, a lot of people will say, that's harsh. And a lot of people will say, well, that's not what I've always thought. The devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's the father of liars. He's the father of lies. And he brings people to follow whatever they will, whatever it will take to keep them from being faithful. Now, let's look at verse 10, 10 through 12. And what I want us to see here is the power of Grace. Grace. You need to hear more about grace in the Lord's church than you do anywhere else. Mentioned over 300 times in the Bible, grace is powerful and grace is what our faith is built upon. It is what it's all about. You are saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship, Ephesians 2 10, through his grace. As we grow, this grace has appeared to all men. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Grace. What does Peter have to say about it? Look there in verse 10. May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silas, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I've written to you briefly. That's what all preachers say. Exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. Now, let's go backwards through there. The grace of God in which you stand. How do you stand on grace? You've got to understand what grace is. Grace is understanding that Jesus paid for your salvation. Grace is understanding that you're not going to be perfect, that you're fallible, that you will make mistakes, but grace is understanding that God forgives the sin of the person who continues to walk in the light. And so as you and I go through life, many times we listen to the liar, Satan, the Diablos, who says you're not good enough to be a Christian. You've made too many mistakes to be a Christian. You're not living the way you need to be because you've messed up. Stand in God's grace. Recognize that God loves you. Recognize Jesus died for you. Recognize that God wants you in heaven and he's done everything that he can. And you are enough if you are living in Christ. Now, backing up a little bit, we see that God is a God of all grace. That's the source. The way you can forgive your brother is by seeing the way that God has forgiven you. The way you can live your life is seeing the example in Jesus who lived his life here upon this earth to show us how to live. And what does a God of grace do for me and for you? Keep reading here. He perfects us, not makes us perfect, but makes us whole, makes us complete. It's a better translation. He establishes us. He gives us a root, a place where we can stay against all the erosion and against all the wind that's out there. He strengthens and he settles us. Grace, grace greater than all of our sin. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And in our last point, 
Looking there in verse 13 and 14, she who is in Babylon, some people say this is Rome, very likely it's actually Babylon. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greet you, and so does Mark my son, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ Jesus, amen. Now I've told you before, when I was in college, I spent a month in Russia, it was cold. One of the habits that they had there, traditions they had there, is they greeted one another before services with a holy kiss. Now, when I was a teenager, I thought this would be a cool thing. You know, there's a good looking girl in the youth group, greet with a holy kiss. You never get to kiss the people you want. And that's the way Russia was. All the men would line up over here, all the women would line up over there. And so you'd go through about 40 guys and you'd kiss them all on the cheek, beards and all. I was so glad to come back to America. Not just because of that, because of the food, because of the cold, and all sorts of things. Bless those people. I'm proud that the church is doing so well there. But I'm glad we don't practice that cultural thing, which they did. But what do we mean when we're reading there about that holy kiss of love? First of all, you've got to have feelings towards someone if you're willing to touch your mouth to their cheek. You've got to be willing to at least treat them as equal. And that's what the church is about. That's what the church is about. Us showing affection one to another. Before the pandemic, we used to hug and we used to shake hands. We still do that a little bit even today. But that's a symbol, a social symbol of showing that I love you. I love being with you. I enjoy us being together. But really, Peter is going beyond that cultural thing, and he's describing this greeting kiss that they did, and he says, your kiss needs to be of love. In other words, don't take advantage of one another. Don't kiss somebody just because they're important. Don't kiss somebody just because they're pretty. Don't kiss somebody just because of the social aspect, but do it in a spirit of love. You see love in a church, first of all, when everybody treats one another well, and you see love in a church when people will not take advantage of other folks. Instead of seeing what you can get from folks, you show them love. You show them service. You show them kindness at every opportunity that you can. And so that's it. That's our five keys to a rock-solid church. You need to have good leadership. You need to make sure that you treat one another well. You need to make sure that you understand grace. You need to be aware that Satan's going to lie. And you need to know your Bible well enough, like Jesus did in Matthew 4, to quote those scriptures right back and say, No, Satan, this is what the Bible says. And you need to love your brethren, to serve your brethren, and to lift up your brethren. Like I said, I think we have a lot of this handled here at Ben. I think one of the things that makes this a good congregation is the way in which we work with these, these things. But we still can always do better. We still can always grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can still look more and more like Jesus.